Many of us have experienced the confusion that follows a traffic accident and have tried to summarize what happened in a few, just a few words or less. Of course, I take a little longer when I'm writing that out. Uh, but on, you know, on insurance and accident forms and uh, some of the following quotes, I wanted to read at least a few of them. You can read all of them, of course, in the book. Uh, they were taken right off of such forms and eventually were published not very long ago uh, in a newspaper. Uh, here's, here's some of the things that people have written on these accident or, you know, insurance accident type forms. Uh, a truck backed through my windshield into my wife's face. Uh, as I approached the intersection, a stop sign appeared in a place where no stop sign had ever appeared before. I was unable to stop in time to avoid the accident. Coming home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree I don't have. The other car collided with mine without giving a warning of its intentions. I thought my window was down, but found it was up when I put my hand through it. I collided with a stationary truck coming the other way. A pedestrian hit me and went under my car. A guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. In my attempt to kill a fly, I, I drove into a telephone pole. Uh, I, I had been driving my car for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. Well, I don't know, Dub could top that. He's been driving, I guess, for 80 years. Uh, to avoid hitting the bumper of the car in front, I struck a pedestrian. My car was legally parked as it backed into the other vehicle. Legally parked and backed into the, well, we won't get off on the thing of the three laws of thought and about uh, logical contradiction, will we? Uh, an invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my vehicle, and vanished. <laughs> the pedestrian had no idea which way to go, so I ran over him. <laughs> the indirect cause of this accident was a little guy in a small car with a big mouth. <laughs> Sorry, Michael Hatcher, I had to just go ahead and say that one. Small car with a big... never mind. The telephone pole was approaching fast. I was attempting to swerve out of its path when it struck my front end. I was on the way... this is my favorite, the last one. I was on my way to the doctor's with rear-end trouble when my universal joint gave way, causing me to have an accident. I was on my way to the doctor's with rear-end trouble. Well, I guess we know what kind of doctor that was. Uh, do, you, do you see a theme running through these explanations? There's a theme running through this. You know, ever since Adam and Eve were created humans, like in Genesis 3, if you go back and read verses 12 and 13, the humans have offered to what psychologists call transfer the blame. You transfer it, of course, off of yourself and on to someone or some other entity, at least, usually another person. Some have made claims in the Bible. If you turn back to Exodus chapter 3, and you see Moses making his, uh, his excuses. Some have, have offered, you know, to, to, uh, to claim at least, I'm inadequate, I, I can't handle this, I'm, not, I'm just not up to the task, you know, I really can't, I just really can't do this. Remember in verse 11 of Exodus 3, but Moses said to God, uh, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Uh, and you go on over to chapter 4, I believe it is, verse 10, uh, and he uh, says, Then Moses said to God, he gives another excuse, and he says, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since have you spoken to your servant. This hasn't happened before, before or since. I, uh, you can't saddle me uh, with this task, surely. Uh, He's, uh, he says, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. 
I hate that last part of that verse. Slow of speech and slow of tongue. Wow. It's one of the most horrible verses in, in the Bible, at least to me. Uh, but, but really, you see what he's, you see what he's doing. Uh, you see uh, elsewhere in Scripture, well, I've listed a few there. You'd think of many more, I'm sure, <laughs> such as Judges 6 and verse 15, talking about Gideon. Uh, and so, so he said to him, Oh, my Lord, and it was all oh, my, uh, my father here, he says, How can I save Israel? Indeed, now watch his move here, Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least, I'm the least tiniest in my father's house. I can't do it. Uh, he, you know, I'm inadequate. I just, you know, I don't know why you're giving me this sign. There's some other verses we list there. there. Uh, in Matthew 25, verses 24 and 25, you see that it, really what in essence is happening there is that the person is blaming their employer. They're blaming the employer for, for the, for, you know, for their fault. Uh, or even, uh, some have even tried before God to excuse uh, idolatry, like Aaron and others in Exodus 32, uh, verse 24. You remember, it's like this golden calf just sort of came together and just popped out of this fire, and there it was. Uh, there was no design or teleology back of it that my hands and others worked on it and, of course, did it. But, of course, we know the truth about that, don't we? Over and over again, uh, the book, the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, uh, the, the response of deity to all of that is the doctrine of what I'm calling the doctrine of no excuses and putting first things first. You go back and study it carefully, and that's exactly what you should do, uh, draw or, or conclude, that you should deduce from the verses that God has given us about real people. Oh, sometimes it's parabolic or in parables. But, but you see yourself, of course, even there in those uh, parables that Jesus set forth, especially in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, you think of it's, it's to put first things first. And you say, is God, is Jesus really, you know, uh, is he really going to come on strong? Is he really going to be, you know, rough on us? Or isn't it that I'm just, I'm, I'm better than most people, so that's okay. And that would apply surely even to uh, Bible study. Remember Jesus, of course, in uh, Luke chapter 9, we've listed this in the book, uh, and it says, As they went on the way, a certain man said, verse 57 of Luke 9, and said unto him, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Notice I underlined my Bible with a red pen. Said. He said it, but did he do it? And I think that's a lot about what my chapter, at least, I think is all about. He said unto him, I will follow. He said it. But did he, was he really willing to do it? Whithersoever thou goest, and Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds, you know the verse, uh, of the heaven have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. Did he mean it? It says, uh, immediately then it says, But he said, he gives an excuse, Lord, uh, uh, suffer, allow me first to go and bury my father. I've got a funeral pending here. But he said unto him, think about how strong this is about what is pri the prioritization that we all must make concerning God about the scripture. He says, but go, he says, leave the dead to bury the dead, but go thou and publish abroad the kingdom of God. It, something has the priority. Something has the superiority or the ascendancy over something else. It's not that this is evil or wrong. Certainly to go to a funeral is not and be involved in a funeral. But as far as if you have to make a choice, what choice then will you make? What is the most important thing? Well, the person's already dead. You can't change that. Another one said in verse 61 of Luke 9, I will follow thee. Notice he said it. But did he follow through? Lord, but first suffer, allow me to bid farewell to them that are at my house. Surely it's okay to say some good, tearful goodbyes, and then I'll follow you. But Jesus, in verse 62, said unto him, I didn't write this, and you didn't either. He says, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Wow! Did you write that? I don't think so. Uh, we would have softened it. 
Just as we sometimes soften verses, you know, without actually maybe uh, getting some liquid paper out and wiping it out, but we soften verses uh, about a lot of this, including Bible study and so forth, and, and being regular, say, in daily Bible study, uh, and, and really involved in seriously meditating on Scripture so that we do thoroughly learn what's involved in ascertaining uh, God's authority for everything that we believe and practice. We, we become, uh, oh, I guess I remember seeing a movie and the, and the principal kept calling the young man, uh, you're a slacker. And some of us become slackers like in Back to the Future. We're slackers about uh, some of this when it all is, you know, is said and done, although maybe we can really talk, of course, a good game. I just say that uh, why should we be, how can we be so slow in getting this and grasping this since you see it uh, throughout Scripture. And again, nowhere is the tendency uh, to offer excuses stronger than when we're faced with demands on the part of God for us not, I would say, to neglect Bible, uh, the study of His Word. You see this in such verses as Psalm 119, verse 16, and verse 18, which really requires of us that uh, we do this. It's not there just as an accident or anything, but it is demanding this type of thing uh, of us. We must do it. And yet again, I think we try to kind of maybe water it down just a little bit. In Psalm uh, verse, chapter 119, verse 16, uh, it says this, I will delight myself in your statutes. It's one thing, brethren, to study the Word of God, but it's another to believe it so much that you get it imbibed into your soul or spirit to where you say, I will delight myself in your statutes instead of, and you're laying down, going to go to sleep, and all of a sudden you, you wake up and say, oh, I haven't read my chapter today. I've got to get up and turn the light on, and I get it out and say, oh, where am I? I'm over here now. Oh, boy, it's those genealogies again. I don't think I can handle it. You know, and so and so begat so and so and so and so begat. So. And you say, got my chapter done. Back to sleep, cut the light out. That's not what he's talking about there. He said, I will not forget your word. Why? It's a prerequisite. I will delight myself. That's a disposition, an attitude of heart. I, I will delight myself in your statutes. If you look also, of course, down at verse 18, and he says, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Open my eyes. And the only way that's going to happen is when you personally are meditating uh, on you know, and studying, of course, his word. Paul, you remember in Ephesians 6 and verse 13, set out a, what I'll call a non-negotiable requirement to remain faithful. And this is what he said. Remember it in Ephesians 6, 13? He said, Wherefore, take up the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, he says, to stand. Uh, that, and that's the only way it can really occur. Some of us sit around and kind of wonder, why is this brother or sister so strong? Why can this sister endure all these things that she's enduring? Well, uh, it's told us in Scripture uh, why. We surely live, as Paul's dealing with, in an evil day. And I'd ask you this morning, uh, are you taking Paul's inspired advice? Uh, are you really taking his uh, inspired advice? Or are you just saying it? Are you just talking it? Put on the whole armor of God. In verse 11 there, Ephesians said, "...that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil." But you've got to what first? It's prerequisite. It's A implies B. Uh, and A must be true in your life and mine, or you can't say B is true in your life. Yes, that's logic. It's just simple common sense, actually. And though this armor uh, is, you know, is clearly described in Ephesians 6, verses 14 through about verse 18, it seems Satan's uh, wiles there, like in verse 11 that he refers to, have confused it in the minds of many Christians. Now, let me paraphrase here uh, Ephesians 6, verses 14 through 18, according to some. Their view might well be expressed like this. Gird your loins with secular materials in a casual search for truth. 
have on the breastplate of semi-godliness, since after all you're better than average, and having your feet shod with the gospel of, of peace at almost any price, Above all, taking the shield of accreditation, accreditation and the new hermeneutic uh, with the helmet of economic security provided by perhaps a morally doubtful job and the sword of the postmodern relativistic thought gleaned from the movies and the TV programs, the non-Christian magazines I've got coming into my home and got to have it materialistic catalogs Praying always to the departments of Bible. Well, no, I cross that out. Just say departments of theology and uh, denominationalism. And to your cronies in spiritual shallowness. Well, there it is so far as what people are doing, including in our own brotherhood, including especially some of the, or all, almost all of our Christian colleges. Theology and denominationalism uh, here. And is, is comes to the forefront instead of the Bible and, and, and saying, in fact, my school that I graduated from and have a master's degree from, they've changed it. And it's now the Harding University, you know, School of Theology. So I'll put it down. Uh, Gary Summers, put this down. I am a theologian now, and I want you to recognize that. Well, what does that mean about your salvation for you when you stand before God? <clears throat> Such Christian compromise, as I, put, as I put in the chapter, is no armor at all. It is no armor at all. Uh, how much better to be undergirded with the revealed truth and, and the proper view of biblical inerrancy so that we truly have a genuine hope of salvation. And now notice in those Ephesians, verses, Ephesians 6, verses 14 through 18, uh, you'll notice there that... Uh, that uh, it's, it's a situation where the Christian is to stand, Paul said, that I just read a minute ago. You are to stand and not to retreat. You notice then that there is no armor uh, that is provided for your back. For your back. And therefore, we know that the Christian's chief offensive weapon is the sword of the Spirit, uh, which is the Word of God that meets each particular need, at least by principle, if not by specifics. But only if it can be said about us, uh, male or female, young or old, only if it can be said about us that uh, Psalm 1 verse 2, his or her delight is in the law of Jehovah. Notice that word delight again. Delight is in the law of Jehovah, and on his law doth he meditate day and night. That means nobody can do your studying for you. Nobody can make these logical deductions from Scripture, uh, certainly in a proper way, without being personally involved in their own mind thinking through and doing that. It's not that someone can just hand you truths of A, B, and C. It is a, is a, a delight type of thing. And we should, do you really enjoy studying the Bible? Or is it that sort of a, you know, like I said, getting up in the middle of the night because you forgot to read your chapter? That day? That's not meditating. That's not med what he's talking about on his law. Does he meditate day and night? You surely see the difference. If some of us studied for some of our uh, uh, ju junior high or high school or college classes like we study the Bible, we would surely flunk out, brethren. We would flunk out. That's all there is to it. It must be a studious type of thing. And not for the prestige of being a, a studious person and recognizes that, but because you want to imbibe the scriptural principles and specific truths of Scripture into your heart and mind uh, and soul. Now, if you look at 2 Timothy 2.15, I know a lot of the verses some have already said are ones that we all are, you know, basically we're familiar with them. We've, we've seen them. We've read them. Uh, but let's kind of look at it again. Uh, and this is where uh, in a direct address to Timothy, Paul demanded this in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. He says, the King James says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that declaration implies to, that each and every individual Christian must be constant or steadfast, in other words, in number one, regular meditation upon God's divine word, and, and number two, in simultaneously accompanying this, 
by making the necessary divisions, in other words, the differences and likenesses, I guess we could say likenesses, uh, uh, or distinctions that are involved in such a study of the biblical text so as to truly ascertain God's will. And a lot of books have been uh, put out by our brethren, great books from here and other uh, lectureships about that, rightly dividing uh, the word. Uh, the American Standard of 1901 translates those same apostolic instructions as to demand as a demand to give diligence. Doesn't that fit with what I've said already? And that eagerness idea, the disposition of heart that you really want to get this. You want to understand uh, what God's mind is telling you through Scripture here about Himself and everything to do uh, with with life. Give diligence. Give dil that means work at it. Like you would a college classroom, like a class, like I said. Give diligence to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Handling, changes a little bit, handling aright the word of truth. So it therefore emphasizes what? It's emphasizing the intensity and the perseverance, the steadiness and regularity of it, involved in one's careful effort to handle the word of truth aright by possession of sufficient interpretational hermeneutical skills to accomplish the task of being personally approved by deity himself. Uh, what could be more serious than that? Uh, though our postmodern age revels in, in a view involving the relativity of truth, as you well know, uh, the words rightly in the King James or a right and the American Standard, by implication, calls such revelers fools. When they go the route of relativity uh, about truth, they're just being fools. Uh, because uh, rightly means rightly divided. Not wrongly divided. Think you've rightly divided and you're okay. That's not what it says. It's to divide the word a handling a right. There's a right way and a wrong way to, to study and look at this book. Not only your initial outlook about it and concluding that it's inspired, uh, and it's inspired in a, like I say, in a biblically inerrant situation. This is the problem with a bunch of our schools. We have people in a so-called theology department that they no more believe the Bible, uh, what the amount of it is what you could hold in a thimble. They, they are in serious shape about that when you really study it out and you find out the undergirding problem is their view uh, that scriptures really are not inerrant. Uh, well, to the faithful Jewish follower of God, uh, none of this is new. It was new to him, uh, at least if he studied the Word, it's not. For he knew that he must esteem truth uh, of, as, as of inestimable value. He was required to, if you look at Zechariah chapter 8, to uh, speak ye every man the truth with his neighbor. They were required to see it that way. Execute the judgment of of truth and peace in your gates. And in fact, he was obligated, get this, when you look at Zechariah 8, he was obligated to love truth. To love truth. I've heard some of my own brethren say, oh, you weren't required to do anything. But basically they're saying by, by sort of a rote uh, action, a rote memorization and things. And, and you didn't have to, you know, have a heart type situation that Jesus, you know, changed it and made it. Though. No, he didn't. Go back and read the Ten Commandments, and you'll see different than that. Was covetousness forbidden? And where does that occur? Yeah, in the human heart. God wanted a change of heart always. Jesus didn't come along and teach a new doctrine about those matters in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, he was just simply getting them back to where it should have been uh, in the first place. Uh, some very good materials have been written on some of that. Uh, notice also they were Proverbs 3 verse 3 they were to love truth and they were to write these truths on the tablet of his heart Proverbs 3 verse 3 and uh, surely this means something far beyond a rote mechanical uh, learning and so called obedience surely this demands that we have an open open attentive ears to those trying to teach us God's word and I just ask you this morning are you eager are you really eager to learn uh, God's Word? Uh, Marshall's Interlinear uh, says it allows us a further glimpse of the attitude or spirit demanded of us by translating the first part of 2 Timothy 2.15 this way. 
Be eager. Be eager. Now be honest this morning. Or I'm sometimes not eager to study uh, the, the Word. There's things that conflict sometimes. But it's, he says, be eager to present thyself approved. There should be an eagerness involved in it. And to, in order to initially obey the gospel of Christ, remain faithful to Jesus afterwards, one sees that Bible study is a, is a necessary, non-optional work by an earnest workman or laborer and not something for which ultimate responsibility, maybe this is the problem, uh, not something for which ultimate responsibility can be shrugged off on one's Bible class teachers, uh, the preacher, the pastors or elders uh, in a local congregation, or not even shrugging it off onto your parents. Uh, when a Christian truly realizes that this is the, uh, is the magnificent deity, the omnipotent God, all the omnitraits here uh, that God has, uh, then surely it will help you change your mind. When a Christian truly realizes that it is the magnificent deity whom he is trying, he or she is trying to please, he or she will automatically demonstrate the essential quality of his true character, as did many, as we've often pointed out, in the synagogue of the Jews in Berea, when those people were blessed to hear the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ being taught by Paul and Silas, Luke reports that they received the word, watch this, they received the word with all readiness of mind, examining the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. I think we sometimes stress the part about whether these things were so and rightly dividing, but you better back up and look at that how they received the word with all readiness of mind. That's a prerequisite, don't you see? It's attitudinal. Uh, the, do you have to have it right? Yes. But the only way you're going to get it right is being eager and having this right uh, attitude of readiness of mind. And it's stressed in uh, Scripture. So this just simply means this, brother. It means that above all else, above all else, uh, he is saying that they personally sought truth with an intensity and a joyful persistence uh, in the soul maintained by individuals possessing a yearning to please God in everything they believe and practice. Well, you remember when, that when Philip was called by Jesus, that Philip in turn sought out Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Nazareth, the son of Joseph, John 1, verse 45. Now you note that that disciple's faith was, was an evidential one. That is, it was based on the concrete Old Testament public evidence or proof which was available to any honest truth seeker. And when Nathaniel responded somewhat skeptically by saying, Can any good thing come out of San Mateo, California, uh, Nazareth, John 1, verse 46, Philip did not respond with a call for blind faith. That's what denominations, for the most part, some of our own brethren call for, blind faith. He did not say, uh, Nathan, old boy, you just need to accept my assertion as truth. You just have faith in my faith in Christ. Instead, Philip said what? Come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself. It's still in John 1, verse 46. Nathaniel then personally sought the truth with an openness, and I would dare say an eagerness and a an, uh, joyful intensity, which the Lord then rewarded with proof of his Messiahship and with a promise of even greater evidence regarding himself and his mission. John 1, verses 47 through 50. And I just say, brother or sister in Christ church, is this characteristic this morning of you? Is it? Have we not many times seen in our congregation an absence of this disposition of, of heart? Instead, uh, can we not all cite instances in our own lives even, if we're honest, where uh, we wrongfully maintained and perhaps even publicly demonstrated before others more of the attitude and, dis and disposition of those of some in Thessalonica? Yes, I think so. Some Christians, let me just say this, and I really believe this. I put it in the chapter but some Christians, uh, I'm convinced that some Christians are so ill-disposed toward any genuine personal meditation upon Scripture that if such was available, 
they would buy and read Cliff's notes on 2 John and Jude. That's how bad it is with some. What about you? If you didn't know, those are very short things already. <laughs> Did you even know that? Some of us may not. This is why some of our teenagers, uh, at least many of them, leave the faith because it's not their own. They didn't study it for themselves. You, have, you can't have faith in mama and daddy's faith in Jesus Christ. It won't work. You must have it for yourself. Uh, well, haven't we become very adept at making excuses for our behavior? Some in the church are, have become experts in pardonable sin. A sister at, in Christ at one congregation where I preach once told me to, she wanted me to make her want to learn the Bible. Brother, it's not my job to make anybody want to learn the Scripture. Not in the strict sense of it anyway. I can encourage, and, and we ought to do that. But despite being inspired and setting a perfect example, even the Lord himself could not motivate everyone to want to learn his word. He couldn't do it. And he was perfect in his, uh, not only in his teaching, which many times we're not, of course, because we're not inspired today. Uh, we have the inspired word. Uh, but he, if Jesus couldn't do it, and he had the perfect methodology even of teaching others. And he couldn't make them all want to learn his word. It's got to come finally from you. That's where it ultimately derives. And although I've always done my best to preach and teach in an interesting and an encouraging way, uh, uh, ultimately your motivation must come from inside you, in your mind or heart. We surely become like Jesus, uh, those Jesus described as being invited to a great supper, but who all with one consent began to make excuse, Luke 14 and verse 18. All with one uh, consent began to make excuse. Minister James Moore rightly points out, he said, Our problem is not that we hesitate to admit anything. Our problem is that we are learning how to justify everything. We have excellent excuses for anything we want to do. We have become powerfully proficient at excusing ourselves. We have become amazingly eloquent at justifying our wrongdoings, excusing our worst sins, including, brethren, the, our refusal to be steadfast in regular Bible study and thoroughly learning what is involved in ascertaining the Lord's authority for all uh, that we believe and practice. At one point in Tolstoy's novel War and Peace, the main character, Pierre, is forced to face himself and make an honest evaluation of his life and he says it for all of us. He says, yes, Lord, I have sinned, but I have several excellent excuses. There it is. There it is. What about you? Well, uh, Moore reported several excuses he's heard over the years for missing church. He called it worship services. He said one of which was offered by a woman who explained why she didn't go to worship service. Here's what she said. This is my reason. If I go some of the time, it makes me want to go all of the time. And since I can't go all the time, it makes me feel guilty when I miss some of the time. So I don't go any of the time, and this keeps me from feeling guilty about wanting to go all the time. <laughs> I don't know exactly what to say to that, do you? <laughs> wow. Plot that one out and draw a logical little, you know, some premises there and put them together, what she's doing. I know this, it's false, isn't it? It won't work. In our attempts to act like we have no re free w real free will or choice in our failure to meditate publicly and privately on God's Word, do we pick up, I guess, on Flip Wilson's famous phrase, the devil made me do it in order to avoid responsibility. War Moore offers us another favorite illustration of how we humans seek to absolve, uh, seek to absolve ourselves of personal responsibility. He gave this scapegoat. A woman had bought a very expensive new dress. And her husband asked her why she had been so extravagant. And she replied, the devil made me do it. Well, the husband asked, why didn't you say to the devil, get thee behind me, Satan? She said, the wife explained, I did. But he said the dress looked as good in the back as it did in the front, so I bought it. <laughs> What do you say to that? Again, we see in Scripture, of course, uh, Luke 14, verses 16 and 18. Do you remember those, how Jesus described the response 
uh, of the Lord of the house to the three excuses that were offered to him in the form of land and oxen purchases, you know, in marriage. These, these uh, after he had called the meant so many to come to this great, his great feast, and these three rationalizations there in Luke 14 amounted to alleging number one, I've got serious real estate or business responsibilities. Uh, number two, I'm a farmer uh, who must attend to my new John Deere tractors, combines, and hay balers. Number, uh, and the one surely, the uh, one who offered surely the best excuse of all in saying, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. In a vote taken at the hen-pecked husband convention, this last one won the blue ribbon hands down, brother. I married a wife. Well, when he, when he, did I say that, Gary, right? You know, before it wouldn't be as offensive to, well, you know who. He gave me that one, so you can talk with him later about that. But when he, when he was told these things, what did the master of the house do? It says in Luke, mark this down, Luke 14, 21. If you don't look at any other verse today, look at that verse. It says that the master of the house became angry. He became angry upon hearing those three rationalizations. Uh, well, it, you know, it's, it's a serious thing. And he went on to say in Luke 14, 23, For I say unto you that none of these men who were bidden shall taste of my supper. Do you understand that this phrase, my supper, ought to cause us to shake and to tremble like Felix did in Acts 24, verse 5, if we're still trying to excuse ourselves from serious study of this book? Uh, well, again, uh, you know, we give excuses. Could the principles here be practically applied or translated over into our similarly offering excuses to the Lord Jesus Christ? We would might say something like this, uh, Lord... Well, number one, I'm busy with reading and studying really important stuff like my upcoming real, for my upcoming real estate exam. Number two, I'm needing to catch up on reading and learning the latest farming techniques in Progressive Farmer magazine and, and that repair and that repair manual for my four wheelers. Uh, number three, when I come home from work, it's all I can do to glance at the newspaper, watch a little TV, and then spend time with my wife and kids. There's just not enough time in the day to master the Bible. Surely we can see that such excuse making can and will keep us out of heaven just as it did the, these Jews that Jesus was dealing with unless they repented. Luke 13, verse 3. Question this morning, are you willing to do what's necessary to remain faithful uh, to Christ? I hope that you'll read the rest of the things that we put in the book and be honest as you go through that. And say according to Matthew 5 and verse 6, Blessed are they that what? Hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I ask you this question. Have you worked up an appetite yet? Have you worked up an appetite yet? Are you really eager to study uh, God's Word? It doesn't mean you always have to be on a high when you're studying His Word, but the fact is you should still be receiving that Word uh, with uh, joy. And we would conclude this. I say, what about you, dear brother or sister? Are you steadfast in regular daily Bible study? Are you genuinely seeking in a thoroughgoing manner to improve your ability to ascertain Christ's authority for all you believe and practice? How do you compare to the following uh, two individuals? He was an adult trying to learn Spanish. Whenever he saw a new book on the subject, he bought it. Wherever he found records and tapes and CDs on learning the language, he bought them. He owned every book in print uh, on the subject of learning Spanish. He seemed to think that if he bought enough books, he would learn the language. Well, you know the truth of it. A minister once visited, we closed with this, visited once in the home of a spasmodic church attender, and he found scores of, of books on religion, even some, of course, about the Bible. And she brought them out by the armful, you know, to show the preacher. And apparently she thought that if she owned books about Christ, she would be a Christian. Certainly no one disputes the value of Christian books. But still, it is not the books we own that help us, but the ones we read, and especially God's Word. Thank you very much.